today on this Father's Day, and we're truly delighted that you've come to listen to the word of our guest speaker. Our Father's Day guest speaker is Elder Roger Richard Lotson, Jr., first born to the Reverend Dr. Roger B. Lotson, Sr., and Evangelist Charlene Lotson on June 27th. 1982 in Portsmouth, Virginia. As you know, he has a birthday coming up, and I'm sure that uh, we'll spank him a little bit and wish him happy birthday. That's a good way to get a lick in on him. <laughs> in April of 2008, Elder Lotson married the great love of his life, the former Fallon Brown and the couple was blessed with a precious daughter, Ariana Cadence Lotson, in 2012. Elder Lotson received his associate degree in science, of science in business administration from the College of Coastal Georgia and a bachelor of science degree in accounting from Georgia Southern University. He performed his initial sermon on October 12, 2008, and was licensed in the Church of God in Christ, Incorporated, October 2010. And he was ordained an elder in the Church of God in Christ, Incorporated, and was chosen to serve as an associate pastor of Sam's Memorial Church of God in Christ in January 2012. Elder Lotson relocated to Columbus, Georgia, 
the summer of 2013 and continues to embrace his passion for serving others inside and outside of the church. Since 2013, he has worked in an accounting position with St. Francis Hospital, which is a nonprofit faith-based institution. He was promoted in January 2015 to management within the financial institution, and God has truly blessed Elder Lotson, and he strives daily to be a blessing for others. After the singing of our choir, we will be blessed by a word from Elder Lotson. One of these mornings And it won't be very long Right by, by my side. 
is well done My work, my work will be done And we'll walk around Give God a hand in this place. All right, that was real nice if I said, let's give me a hand, but let's give God a hand in this place. <laughs> ah. Is it working? All right. <laughs> Amen. I don't know about you, but God's been a little too good to me for me to sit down on his praise. He gave me traveling mercies on the highways and byways. He gave me a beautiful wife and daughter sitting to my right. And I'm just excited to be in the place one more time. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads briefly. Bow your heads briefly for a moment. Heavenly Father, I come to you today, a simple man with a simple prayer, that not my words, but your words be heard, not my thoughts, but your thoughts be expressed, not what I want to say, but what you want to be said would come out through me. Father, I ask that you open their ears, open their hearts, and open their minds to what thus said the Lord on today, and we thank you and we praise you in your presence, amen and amen. Amen. I have an apology to make on today to some of you. I received a call from my father on last night, and he reminded me on how special it is to be asked back to a church. And he reminded me that the main reason he doesn't ask people back to his church is because they preach too long. <laughs> So for those of y'all that came for 30 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half, I sincerely apologize because on this Father's Day, I'm going to listen to my father <laughs> and I'm going to be short and I'm going to be sweet and I'm going to be seated. <laughs> yeah. Now, for those of y'all that were here on last year, you might recall that I brought you some questions. But on this year, I bring you a challenge. Now, on this year, I'm going to challenge you to provoke greatness. But before we get to the challenge, I once again will start with a question. And that question is the title of my sermon. That question is, what are we provoking? Fathers, what are you provoking in your children? Mothers, what are you provoking in your daughters? Aunts and uncles, what are you provoking in the people that are important to you in your life? In church, what are you provoking in your worldly friends that you encounter every day? In other words, what are we provoking in others? Go with me, if you will, to Colossians, the third chapter, and the 21st verse. And we're going to see what the Lord says about provoking. Amen. Colossians, the third chapter, in the 21st verse, reads these words. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be 
discouraged. On today, I want to talk about provoking. And let's see what the dictionary says about provoking. The dictionary definition says provoke is to stimulate, to incite, or to deliberately make someone do or feel something. And usually that something is anger. Are we provoking anger in our children? And more importantly, what type of anger are we provoking? Because I've learned over the last three years of being a father that if you're doing your job right, eventually your children are going to be angry. So anger is unavoidable. But what are we doing with that anger? See, I feel that there are two types of anger. There is destructive anger and there is constructive anger. Too often we are provoking destructive anger. When we look at Charleston, that was destructive anger. When we look at Baltimore, that was destructive anger. When we look at Ferguson, that was destructive anger. Yes, they had a right to be angered, but they did not have a right to destroy the things and the people that did not cause that anger. So what type of anger are we provoking in our children? The first question I want to ask you on today is are we provoking constructive anger? Because constructive anger leads to determination. See, the Bible says in James, the first chapter, in the 19th verse, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man working not the righteousness of God. And when I looked up the word wrath, I found the definition of extreme anger. We need to be aware that sometimes we are provoking extreme anger in our children. But we must teach our children what to do with that anger. We must give them coping skills on how to handle that anger. See, the children in Baltimore had not been taught constructive ways on how to handle their anger. So they went out and did the only thing that they knew how was to be destructive. Because when my daughter at the age of three is angry, she tends to destroy stuff. Now she's smart enough to destroy her own stuff <laughs> for her own safety. <laughs> But it's understandable when she's three. But it's not understandable when they're 13 or when they're 18 or when they're 30 because then they can be taken to jail. And that's what is happening to our children. They don't know how to handle their anger so they are being drug off to jail. They don't know how to handle their anger so they're being kicked out of school. They don't know how to handle their anger so they're destroying the lives of their children and their friends and their family because we're provoking the wrong type of anger. So we need to ask ourselves, does their anger provoke chaos or change? Does their anger produce constructive things or destructive things? Because I implore you on today that Dr. King was just as angry as Minister Malcolm, but he chose to go about it in a different way. Because see, sometimes Minister Malcolm's end was anger, but see, the anger of Dr. King was the beginning of change. And we have to start teaching our children that yes, you can be angry, but that cannot be the end of your journey. Anger can begin change if we provoke the right type of anger. The second question I want to ask you on today is, are we provoking power? In other words, are we provoking power of mind and power of love that the Bible talks about? If you were to go to John, the 14th chapter and the 12th verse, you would find these words, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believe, uh, I'm sorry, if you would go to 2 Timothy, the first chapter, and the seventh verse, you would find these words. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to ask the parents on today, 
Are we so protective of our children that they have never had the necessity to become strong? Are we stopping every little thing from tearing them down and never giving them an opportunity to be built up? See, I heard of a term called a hoverer. And basically what that is is a mother or father that hovers over their children and they stop them from getting hurt and they stop them from dealing with people that don't like them and they stop them from touching things that might hurt them. And they hover all their life and then they send them off to college. And the children sit there and they're waiting for somebody to wash their clothes and they're waiting for somebody to fix the meals and they're waiting for somebody to wake them up and tell them to go to school. And when nobody is there to hover over them, they sit there and they wither and they die. Maybe not physically, but mentally and emotionally because now they don't have anybody hovering over them because they were so protected in their childhood and they were so protected in their adolescence and they were so protected when they were teenagers that they were never torn down by anything or anyone so they could never be built up. Because see, when you want to build a muscle, you must tear that muscle and a stronger muscle must come from under it so you can get stronger. But nobody is allowing our kids to be torn down. I assure you that when I was younger, my father tore me down quite often, but it made me stronger. <laughs> I tell you, when I was younger, I was angry with my father quite often because anytime you treat a boy like a man, he's going to be angry. Anytime you force a boy to act like a man, he's going to be angry. But my father was trying to provoke power in me because someday he was not going to be there to tell me to get up and go to work and take care of my family. So he had to force me to be angry with him sometime so I would be determined to do what was necessary. The last question I want to ask you on today may be the most important question. And that question is, are we provoking greater? John 14 and 12 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my Father, so I say on today, are we teaching our children that good enough is not good enough? <laughs> because he that dwells within me should be greater than he that dwells in the world. Is, are we given the notion, because I noticed that everyone gets a trophy in this society. There's a lot of participation trophies and there's a lot of everybody's winning kind of trophies. But in this type of world, where everybody gets a trophy, are we diminishing the desire to excel? If they know they're gonna get the same thing as the winner, why should they try to do any better? But I implore you that we should be telling our children that good enough is not good enough. That even a degree is not good enough. That even being a doctor and a lawyer is not good enough. We should be striving to be the Attorney General of the United States. We should be striving to sit on the Supreme Court. We should be striving to be the President of the United States because good enough is not good enough for children of the King, not for children of the Most High God. Average is not okay. See, I have some godchildren that I help raise sometimes, and I give them money for their grades. But all of my godchildren know that for C's, they get nothing. Because average is not good enough. And I'm sorry to tell them that when they get D's and F's, I subtract money. <laughs> because when, and I'm just gonna say it, young black boys and young black girls don't do what they need to do, the world will start subtracting things from their life. So I'm training them now that when you're not even average, because of the color of your skin still in this country, the world will subtract some things from you. It will subtract money from your paycheck. It will subtract freedom from your life. If you do not at least be average. And the reason why they get nothing when they get C's, it's because the world will give you nothing if you're average. Because if you're average and you got the same thing as your white counterpart, that's the perfect reason not to give you the job. 
That's the perfect reason. You didn't do anything better than your white counterpart, so I might as well give it to your white counterpart. But they get money for B's, and they get more money for A's, because I need to let them know that you need to go above and beyond just to make it in this race. You need to go above and beyond just to get the same treatment that your counterparts will get. Now, I wish... I didn't have to say that in 2015, but the world has not made it possible for me to ignore the color of their skin yet. So I have to let them know that you have to go above and beyond. So I'm asking, are we provoking something greater? Because for our children, for our little black boys, and for my little black girl, good enough will never be good enough. <laughs> so on today, as I told you, I was going to be short and sweet. <laughs> but I don't claim to know everything and be such a great orator. So I want to leave you today with words from Dr. King. Words from his I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King spoke of a fierce urgency of now. He said this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. He said now is the time to make real the promises. Church, I'm saying on today that we need to have a fierce urgency of now. We cannot be gradual about what's happening to our young black men, what's happening to our young black women because our young black men are no longer around. This is not time to be tranquil about what's going on. Now is the time to make real the promises, but not the promises of democracy. Now is time to make real the promises promises of God, the promises of power, the promises of greater work. I ask on today, are we provoking our children to fulfill the promises of the leaders of this world, or are we provoking our children to fulfill the promises of the king of kings? I ask on today, what are we provoking? Are we provoking something that's mediocre, or are we provoking something that's greater? I challenge you on today to provoke greatness. I challenge you to provoke greatness in your children. I challenge you to provoke greatness in others. I challenge you to provoke greatness in yourself. And I challenge you to know that the first step to greatness is salvation. Pray my strength in the Lord.